Oh god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I, uh, who, who's going to who's gonna take their shirt off first? Ooh, my money's on Nick. Because <laughs> I'm the fat one? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a... I'm Speaking a, of insulation. I'm a beef. <laughs> I'm a beefy boy. <laughs> I'm just more compact beefy. Packed beef. Mm, beef. Please don't start on that line. <laughs> it's going to be hard not to. <laughs> yeah. So uh, is this where we say welcome back? Uh, You're welcome. In nice case it's your so. first time. Yeah. Dick move. There's only two episodes <laughs> and you go to the second one and you don't even listen to the first yeah, one. Yeah, it's not like there's a long list that you have to get through. No. We're not asking a lot. Well, anyway, welcome back to Cage Match, colon, a roundabout way of meeting Nicolas Cage. The podcast where every episode we take two films of uh, America's finest, most hardworking actor. And pit them against each other, and we will decide uh, ultimately uh, what the best Nick Cage film ever is. Yeah, definitively. Definitively. There's going to be no question about it. No. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, I'm Sean with my co-host Nick. I'm Nick, and our producer Peter. Hi. Um. So this week we are discussing two fine films, but you're in for a treat because you get an extra cage for the price of two. We're doing Adaptation and Army of One. So, do you want to give us the first movie? Well, like, do you want to... Sure, we can jump right in. Uh, adaptation. Yeah, let's just bang this out. All right, so... I don't think it should take us that long to talk about this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Adaptation is a 2002 film starring Nick Cage and Nick Cage. Nick Cage plays a fictionalized version of real-life screenwriter Charlie Kaufman... And then fictional, fictional twin brother, Donald Kaufman. Charlie Kaufman, right off uh, the heels of writing Being John Malkovich, has to adapt a film about Orchid. The Orchid Thief is the name of the uh, book. It's a book by Susan Orlean. It's about... Another real life person. Yeah. Fictionalized in this. Which I got to say, that's the most wild shit about this. Like, yeah. did Susan Orlean and John LaRoche actually buy off on this or just like give away we will their get, rights? We will get into this. <laughs> I have crazy. I have notes. So Meryl <laughs> Streep plays uh, Susan Orlean. Charlie Kaufman trying to write this screenplay. Can't write the screenplay. Everything's going to shit. He's circling the drain. Uh, can't get a girlfriend. Can't even sack up to meet Susan Orlean to get any idea of what he is supposed to be writing all the while his layabout twin brother is taking a screenwriting course and writing the worst best action film ever and just immediate success sells it gets a girlfriend has all this unearned confidence that just gets him through life uh so charlie asks his brother to help out on the screenplay and they wind up stalking his prey like, to get a better idea for this film, they start watching Susan Orlean follow her down to, uh, where was it, Florida? Tallahassee, I can't Tallahassee? remember. Something. Louisiana. Somewhere it, swampy. It felt yeah. panhandly. I think it's Florida. Florida sounds right. To find out that she's mixed up with. Yes, because it's the Seminole tribe. Boom. Yeah. Florida State or whatever. And she's mixed up with. Uh, Growing these orchids. This is a sports radio podcast now. Sorry. No worries. Growing <laughs> these orchids uh, for drug purposes and having an affair with uh, John LaRoche, played by Chris Cooper, who is a character. He's certainly something there. We'll get into more detail as we kind of discuss the film. Yeah. Do we want to just do that now? Yeah. Let's, uh, I mean, we're I mean, done recapping. That I seems like the that, perfect time. Yeah. Thoughts? That's probably, probably good. Thoughts, Nick? Oh, man. Uh... This was a tough one for me because it was literally like just watching Cottonmouth. It was just hanging out with him, a friend of ours, who's super kind of in his head for like two hours. Yeah, I mean, like literally you are listening to his inner yeah inner thoughts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was a really well written movie. It's a really well structured movie. 
I understand why it's such a highly regarded movie, and I liked watching it. It's just stressful to me. <laughs> I get that. I mean, he is not a relatable protagonist. Other, right. other than right now, how sweaty he is at the beginning. Oh, my is God. He's very so relatable. <laughs> <laughs> it is warm in Seattle today. I mean, I personally loved this film. I haven't seen it since like 2004, uh, but it's so good. It has so much fun stuff. And just you get a lot of like cage on cage action with him acting against himself and also just masturbating a lot. Oh, yeah. Yep. There, uh, that that happens. But just watching him spiral and trying to write this book that has no central write, write a screenplay about a book that has no central plot and circling the drain trying to figure out what it's about yeah there's no action no drama it's just about looking for a flower somebody gets shot no like i mean oh in the in the, in book. the, the movie that he's trying to oh, write. In the screenplay yes there's none of that yeah no there's no action but we find out there's plenty of action behind the scenes as uh susan orlean is having an affair getting down with I mean, I think the real star character here is John LaRoche, just whacked out crazy guy, missing. Yeah, he's missing his front teeth. Obsessed with whatever strikes his current fancy. At the beginning of the movie, it's orchids. Halfway through, it's online pornography and the making of online pornography. Mm Mm-hmm. I I don't forget the most important one, uh, Dutch Mirrors. Oh, <laughs> I did forget about that. This is supposedly a comedy. Yeah, I, I kind of think that we got this miscategorized. It should have been better suited in the fucking weird area. I think but. it's sold as a comedy. I mean, it definitely is sold as a comedy. That's how it's listed. It's sort of a dark comedy. You know, Wikipedia classifies it as such. IMDb classifies it as such. Did I laugh? I had a couple Ooh. laughs. I had one particular one. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Donald gets launched out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good scene. Just head first. Uh, very ragdoll style. <laughs> um, any specific scenes uh, speak to you on this film, Nick? It's a hard one because it's not really told in a good, in a very linear fashion either. It cuts around a lot. Like favorite scenes. Uh, I don't know if I have like a, a scene that really kind of struck me. I enjoyed the cleverness of LaRoche uh, when they were talking with that sheriff in the beginning. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it was kind of funny, but it, it's kind of one of those where it's like, oh, haha, this guy. He knows his way around this issue and he's going to talk around the cops and everything's going to be hunky dory. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I mean, that's what you get. See, that was the weird one for me. So watching Charlie made you think of our buddy Cottonmouth, but LaRoche just made me think of my friend who got really into meth. Oh, yeah. Just well, that very, you know, I know a lot about everything and can talk my way out of any problem but meth. Apparently he wears a fedora now, I didn't told. Boy, I didn't think you could get lower than meth, but fedora. I, those are two things I generally don't put associate with each other. <laughs> Imagine how fast he can skank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one got me. If only adaptation had writing like that. <laughs> I, I think we do need to talk, though, about like Nick Cage with Nick Cage. Ooh, oh, one, I, I do want to say, speaking of writing, it's it's funny that this movie adaptation has Donald Kaufman listed as a co-author. So it's written by Charlie and Donald Kaufman. This movie is meta as fuck. Yeah, yeah. And for the Academy Awards, it was both Charlie and Donald that were nominated. Fake twin brother Donald. <laughs> yeah. But like, just let's talk about the fact that Yeah, Nick Cage is acting against Nick Cage for large chunks of this film. Yeah. And it works really well. And it's those are the best parts. And those are those parts are pretty funny. Watching Donald try and like write this. The premise of Donald's movie that he's writing is it is a crime thriller 
where a kidnapper kidnaps a woman and the detective is trying to find her, but they're all the same person. Yeah, that's the twist at the end. (laughs) There's a great I don't remember the full quote, and it's not my favorite quote of this film, but there's a great quote about when Charlie's like, how would you even film that? And Donald's just like, cam camera angles all <laughs> oh, right because it's a uh, she's locked herself in the basement or something yes yeah. no. but there's so much good just back and forth there and when they're in the swamp like running for their lives they have oh. really great <laughs> moments together and you find out that charlie's never been happy because he's never done anything and donald is just happy in the fact that the brief moments of happiness he's had even if they've been taken away were still his, so he could live with that. Yeah, he has a nice uh, moment where he talks about like liking somebody, but you know he's not worried about if they don't like him back because that's their deal, not his. Uh, yeah, and it's like uh, that's a sweet sentiment. I mean, kind of. I mean, I get it in a soft-headed sort of way. I can say soft-headed, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we can say soft-headed. We'll... It doesn't really mean anything. I'll look it up. Yeah, Google that. <laughs> Wait. Uh, I'm trying to think who, uh, any other notice, oh. notable people? Oh. Well, uh, speaking of just like the uh, Nicolas Cage, Nicolas Cage, back and forth. Uh, the first time we meet Donald, I really enjoyed that scene where he's just like laying on the ground and Charlie's just having a hard day. And Donald's like, oh, I want to talk to you about this thing. I figured out what I'm going to do. Oh, but I have to lay down my back. And he's just laying on the floor trying to do this scene with himself. And it's just great. Yeah. I, I did enjoy that. Like, so I think my laughs came less from the dialogue and more situationally. Yeah. What did you guys think of the um, writer's workshop? <laughs> oh, God. What's the name of the... Uh... What was the name of the guy? Oh, the author, the uh, McKee or something like that. Yeah. But Brian Cox is the uh, yeah the Robert actor. McKee, who is apparently a real person as well. We can get into that later. Uh, I thought that was great. The whole like fuck voiceovers. Yeah, which this movie ends on a voiceover and then is well calls back to McKee saying fuck voiceovers. McKee's going off and saying like oh don't don't use a voiceover, don't use a Deus Ex Machina, like don't when Charlie's trying to work on this script he goes through a whole list of shit not to include in this because he wanted to avoid all the hollywood tropes so he's like don't make it a heist movie don't include drug running sex guns car chases uh profound life lessons (laughs) the characters growing uh overcoming obstacles or learning to like each other And literally every one of those things happens throughout this movie and all like neatly compact in the end where it's Charlie writing the ending to it. So he just crams everything he didn't want in the movie into the last like 30 minutes of it. Oh, well, so the movie and the movie starts off with this. The world, the universe is created, you know, plants spring up from dirt. uh, Fish walks on the land. You see a baby's head crowning, which did not need. But 41 move minutes into the movie, when Charlie gets his bout of inspiration, he writes that exact opening to his script. Yeah. If you've ever watched the Detroiters, it's a lot like the scene where Tim Robinson and Sam, what's his face, take a bunch of uh, uppers and brainstorm uh, a commercial. It's just like that. He gets all sweaty. He's talking into a recorder. And then I think he throws a chair at a window. All right. I can tell you my biggest laugh from this film. Speaking of deus ex machina and how not to introduce it in the film. Deus ex alligator. Yeah. They are being chased through the swamp. LaRoche has uh, Charlie dead to rights. And alligator just pops out of the water and just murks uh, LaRoche. Yeah, it was very uh, incredible. I, uh, it, it, there's examples of it in every movie. I don't need to fucking make a reference at you know what it looks like when a big animal eats a small animal. <laughs> and then Meryl Streep shows up and just is crying because her hillbilly lover is dead mm-hmm, mm-hmm. after being directly responsible for Donald's death. Yeah. And tells uh, Charlie to shut up, you fat fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is really the twisting of the knife. He wore a fat suit for this movie. 
Did he? Yeah. Oh. See, I figured he would have just gained the weight. No. No commitment to the bit. You know, he never breaks character on set, but uh, which which character? Uh, yeah, all character. <laughs> so he's both Char- Charlie and Donald the whole time. Mm-hmm. Is that true though about him not breaking character? Uh, he stays in character real hard while he's on set. I did not know that. Yeah. So. Oh my god, that's that that's, makes that's, that makes Army of One. That makes yeah. Army of One real rough. Uh, what's her face? The Marcy from Army of One, mm-hmm. and like talks about that in an interview about he like, just stays in character. Well, before we get to Army of One, I do. There are some real interesting things around adaptation. Oh yeah, there's lots of great things. Um, first and foremost. Charlie Kaufman was hired to adapt a screenplay of The Orchid Thief, got massive writer's block, couldn't figure it out for all the reasons he couldn't in the movie, so wrote this instead. Didn't tell his producers he was doing this, just assumed he was going to be fired and never work in Hollywood again, and turned it in. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's, crazy. That's, uh, wow. You know, that's pretty, pretty ballsy, but... I guess if you're just up against a wall and you've got a deadline, it's like, hmm, fucking. at least this was somewhat connected to what he was supposed to do. Yeah, you did turn in homework. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. It's just weird that you wrote an essay on a multiple choice <laughs> test. <laughs> but, Pretty much. Uh, oh, but directed by Spike Jones, who like went to bat for this script. I hadn't realized how few movies he's actually like full on directed. Yeah, it's not many. It's four. Yeah, that's not many. It is not many. <laughs> not good with names and stuff. What, what's he done? Tell okay, me in the so, audience. Yeah, being John Malkovich was first. Okay, obviously yeah. tied with Charlie Kaufman. Then adaptation. Then where the wild things are. Okay, and then yeah. lastly and most recently was her with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. He also did a really awesome short film. Where they come from or where do they come from? It's all about where a pair of old sneakers you find in the gutter really come from i won't spoil it for you but google it it's on youtube it's amazing other fun fact susan orlean was not okay with this when she found out what this was <laughs> saw the script and was just like no you cannot do this no oh. but apparently came around on the idea but was genuinely worried this would completely ruin her reputation right and i mean yeah not not a great character in the film yeah, I guess if you're like a writer for The New Yorker, you don't want movies coming out about you shacking up with toothless Floridians. While doing a bunch of weird green blow. Yeah. Which, I mean, at least Meryl Streep did a great, crazy, strung out Susan Orlean. Yeah. Well, I assume it's great. I don't know what Susan Orlean's actually like, but I'm assuming a lot like the performance. LaRoche and Orlean were on the phone together and oh. they were both really high on Orchid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she had him like match dial tone sounds. Yeah. She just wanted to make a dial tone. Like, don't do anything else. Just go. Oh. It's like, no, you're doing it slightly wrong. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. Much better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do. you got to give this this credit, right? Like three people got nominated for Oscars on this. Mm-hmm. One won. Pretty damn good. Yeah. No, I'm. I, I don't want to make it sound like I don't like the movie. I do like the movie. It's it's really cerebral. It's good. It's got it took me on a great ride. I really enjoyed watching it both times, but it's stressful. It is very it's a stressful film. Yeah. If you have anxiety, it can be upsetting to watch this. I don't know. That's all I got. It's a fun movie. Um, I do have. I mean, I do have other things. Oh, all right. Go for it. I've been just telling my fun facts. Oh, Okay. Uh. Once again, this is not a movie originally intended for Nicolas Cage. It was going to be Tom Hanks playing both roles from what I've read. But Nicolas Cage came in for $5 million again. Hey. And he got both roles. That's two and a half million for each role. I can't really picture this with Hanks playing that. No, neither can I. What was Hanks doing in 2002? He was yeah. working on the terminal. Okay. Why not? Sure. Yeah, the terminal list with Chris Pratt. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, no, I do know the answer to this. He was doing Catch Me Catch Me If You Can. Ooh, yeah, that's that's huh. would be the right era. Still airplane related. Weird. Yeah, yeah, right. In one scene, Charlie Kaufman plays the double for Donald, but the other stand-in 
is Nicolas Cage's actual brother, Mark Coppola. It's fun bringing, you know, family in. And those Coppolas need, you know, need all the help they can get. Yeah, they're a struggling, struggling family. <laughs> struggling yeah. uh, winery. Mm-hmm. I mean, struggling. Speaking of, of finances, this movie cost about like $19 million to make, and it made like $22 million. So Ooh. pretty bad. That's a shame. I mean... It is an art house film, though, so it's not. It did break that hundred thousand mark, it did, which is uh It did beat Jujitsu's hundred thousand mark. <laughs> yeah. All right. Is that the hurdle that movies have to Everything, clear? Yeah. Can you clear the Jujitsu mark? <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I always am curious about these movies why they decide to release them when they do because this came out in early December and just got washed by um, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And then two weeks later, the Lord of the Rings, the Twin Tower, Twin Towers, the Two Towers. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> He's in a 9-11 movie, too. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I liked it. Um, Nick, do you have a favorite quote from this film? I did have a favorite quote from this movie. Donald on the ground just saying, I can't believe I got shot. Isn't that fucked up? <laughs> And then Charlie just saying, shut up, stop laughing. (laughs) (laughs) So mine is uh, Donald, while brainstorming and writing his film with his girlfriend in the room, talking to Charlie, saying, I'm putting in a chase sequence. So the killer flees on horseback with the girl. (laughs) The cops after them on a motorcycle. And it's like battle between motors and horses, like technology versus horse. (laughs) Yeah, Donald is really the best character. Donald is great. Probably why he doesn't exist. <laughs> oh. yeah. I do want to see Donald's movie, though. <laughs> it sounds kind of like... Even if it was like a 30-minute short, that'd be pretty rad. Yeah, I'm into it. I mean, I assumed it would be, have been directed by Shyamalan. But yeah, by and large, I still really enjoyed this film. It's got a lot to like, and... Yeah, there is a lot. I of- recommend it. It is a good movie. I enjoyed it as well. So um, Nick Cage staying in character all the time. This is, oh my God, that uh, that sounds awful for this next film, Army of One from 2016. Uh, Nick, do you want to do you want to sell our listeners on this film? Yeah, <laughs> this is pretty much everything I have on the film, and it's about Gary Faulkner, uh, part time. Sometime construction worker and unemployed handyman just meets up with an old high school crush, then gets a message from God telling him that he needs to go to Pakistan to kill Osama bin Laden. Capture Osama bin Laden. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, capture Osama bin Laden, bring him back for justice and stuff. I think the important thing that was missing from that synopsis is that this is largely based on a real guy and pretty accurate to the story as far as I know. Yeah, it's a wacky. Yeah, but it is another terrific character role. It definitely is a character role. And hey, man, that's not a character that somebody just like, I think, makes up super easy. This guy, he was something. He was. It's okay. So oh. let's just let's just say it. The voice is terrible. <laughs> I don't know. I found it soothing. <laughs> Do I have to be that guy? Do I have to be the guy that defends the people with bad voices? <laughs> I mean, at this point, I think you have to. be. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was rough. I did get used to it after a while. But boy, when it first came on, I was like, what is this? I, no, I heard that voice and I was like, oh, fuck. I identify with this so much (laughs) as he's just like, he's got a bad kidney and he's getting dialysis and he's just sitting there. He's like, you know, what's fucking wrong with this country? Oh my God. That is the voice. (laughs) Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I feel attacked right now. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) Well, that's, that's all my jokes out the window. (laughs) No, it's okay. You can, you can lay it on me. Uh, No, it's tough. (sighs) I'll get into more why it's a shame this movie isn't better, because it should have been better. When we get into who was behind this, it should have been much better. Um, What, you mean like who directed it? You mean the director of uh, Borat or Religulous or Bruno or The Dictator? Because this is what this guy's done. (laughs) 
He's also was involved in the like 2001 tick show entourage, uh, Kirby enthusiasm. Uh, he's got a pedigree. Like a Dalmatian, it's spotty. I'm not saying it would be. Hey. I'm not saying it would be a great movie, but it should have been a lot better. Well, especially if you think like the cast is actually not bad. No, no, it's got a pretty good cast. It's got a uh, mm. fucking Rain Wilson in it. Um, Paul Shear, Will Paul Sasso. Shear. Yeah. Also, Paul Shear's character's name is Pickles. Pickles. <laughs> yeah, Pickles. Uh, it's a great name. Gary Faulkner's best friend. <laughs> this movie starts off as. The most cage thing ever. The first scene of the film is Gary Faulkner hang gliding over Pakistan with a katana. It's an American flag. It's hang an American glider. flag hang and glider. He's got American flag like hang gliding goggles and a sweet ass beard. A boombox hanging from the hang glider playing uh some like surf rock yeah generic surf rock something you can really enjoy hang gliding to yeah and that's how it starts and it's really all downhill from there (laughs) yeah like the next scene is him as a child uh running with a balloon then getting bullied and then hearing the voice of god telling him that his balloon stick was his righteous sword and then we cut to nick cage and tidy whitey's living in a construction site (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he doesn't have money, so he's just crashing in construction sites yeah. that he's worked on. And it's pretty good. Um, then goes to in hang an out American the- flag sleeping bag. An American flag sleeping bag because he's a patriot. He is a Let's patriot. Let's not forget. I think the first big scene is him at the bar with Pickles and uh, Roy, played by Will Sasso, where he gets into it with a Marine because he's complaining how you know the army hasn't caught and the military hasn't caught uh, Osama bin Laden yet. And a Marine, you know, starts giving him shit. So he challenges him to a knife throwing contest. Yeah. Just whips out a big ass. Gary, like, Gary challenges the Marine. Yeah. The Marine has nothing to prove. But it's great. The Marine throws the knife, hits the dartboard. Everyone's duly impressed. Gary lines up, throws the knife and just hits this dude. Will Sasso. Will Sasso. And apparently it's not the first time. It's not again, the- Gary third time he's hit him with this knife <laughs> and apparently he always comes back with just a bruised ego <laughs> it's awesome it's a great scene <laughs> there's like it's a great scene that's the start it's it there's a lot to like at the start then he meets uh he's at the home depot mansplaining everything that you can only buy american made uh you don't want to buy a french toilet because it can't handle a strong american shit well let me tell you one thing when you work in construction, you know that you know more than everybody at Home Depot. It's <laughs> all right, fair. I can't I can't argue with that. No. I know nothing. Everybody at Home I know Depot less is than an idiot. Home Depot. Especially you, Clem. I hope you hear this someday. Don't sue us, Home Depot. Or Clem. Fuck it. Come at me, Clem. Oh, that's gonna be a bit. That's gonna be on a t shirt. Come <laughs> at me, Clem is gonna be our first t shirt. Yeah, um, uh, but no, I mean, like uh, it, it, it was a great scene, too, though. I agree with you. Yeah. And then he meets up with uh, his old high school crush, who apparently used to have a crush on him. And she's got like an American flag tramp stamp. It's not just an American flag. one; It's a Bruce Springsteen oh, American that's right. flag. He somehow slides into her DMs. Shows yeah. up. In- well, he's, you know, voice aside, he's a charming guy. Is he? He's so charming. Well, yeah. You know what? He's an authentic American male. It's all right. That's fair. I'm not going to deny you that. Um, And then she has the weirdest request for going out with her, which is find me. Her only request to for someone to date her is for them to stalk her and show up at her house. Yeah. Well, it sounds like she's pretty busy. So it could have been just been like a nice way of just being like, Sure, I'll go on a date with you, but I don't got time for weeks, so you're going to have to just find me. And then he does and yeah, never leaves. And just brings ice cream for her mute child. Gary's unstoppable love for this child. Yeah. Like, he is such a nice guy. Like, like he's always doing things. He helps rebuild. Like, he tears out their ramp. Yeah, their wheelchair ramp for their house because it was shit. And he goes and builds a new one for them. But it takes him a really long time because Gary's got, you know, a mission from God and other things. But 
I mean, he's a nice guy. He builds them a wheelchair ramp. He brings her gifts like he he plays along and he doesn't do anything to kind of come down on her for her disability. And it's like, oh, he's, That's a, nice. he's a really nice guy. We I think we forgot to mention, though, uh, who plays God in this film, Nick? Oh, it's Russell Brand, obviously. Everyone's vision of God. Yeah, usually. I mean, Russell Brand literally looks like he just walked off the street and they just pointed a camera at him. Yeah, they didn't do anything to kind of like, well, they put like little like godly hand wrappings on him. Again, I think he just walked off the street with that. Oh, maybe. But yeah, uh, Gary gets uh, is going for dialysis because he's got bum kidneys Mm -hmm. and uh, he's told. He tells everybody in the dialysis center what it is just on every subject. Yeah. Um, But then gets a visit from God Mm -hmm. uh, to track down Osama bin Laden and bring him to justice. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Bring him back to America for yeah. justice and stuff. For justice and stuff. God speaks to him a couple more times, despite telling me never going to talk to Gary again, because Gary's apparently a fuck up who yeah. needs God's help. But God will only help those who help themselves. Well, that's tough love, God. <laughs> um, and Gary needs a little tough love. Also, God sells him a katana on the Home Shopping Network for a penny. Yeah. Well, OK, we're really jumping a bit. So, like, <laughs> God tells Gary to go stop Osama bin Laden. And he's like, okay, well, obviously I need a plan. Thinks about it. And he's like, okay, I'm just going to go down to San Diego. I'll buy a sailboat for a thousand dollars and I'll sail to Pakistan from San Diego. I'll capture Osama bin Laden and bring him back to America. Boom plan. And he's confronted with the fact on a couple of occasions that he doesn't know how to sail. Yeah. And not, I mean, a, a really enjoyable line from later in the movie he is just uh, Gary saying, you know, thinking back, not knowing how to sail really was a big setback to this whole plan. And it's like, yeah, because you crashed your boat and ended up in Mexico after like a week on sea. But I think you guys, you missed on the fact that. Matthew Modine is his doctor, who's a pretty good actor. And <laughs> That's right. For some reason in this movie. Oh, yeah. Gary, uh, Gary cons his doctor out of the money. <laughs> yeah. His, for the boat. His liver doctor. He tells him it's for a, an engagement ring so he can marry this girl. Uh, definitely not for a boat to sail to Pakistan. So his uh, second plan is to because he can't fly to Pakistan. So. He's going to hang glide into Pakistan. Yeah. So he goes and buys a hang glider. And while at the hang glider store, well, at the sporting goods store, asks the guy selling the hang glider, um, how many pieces they should cut glider on the plane? Pocket. And the guy's like, you, you, no. Yeah, it's supposed to come in a piece. One yeah. piece. Um, he also asked the guy what some really sweet hang glider music would be. Yes. And the guy's like, I don't know, Tom Petty. And he's like, wrong answer. Idiot. <laughs> Yeah, let's I want to back up real quick. Okay. He went he flew to Israel. That's right. To hang glide from a mountain to Pakistan. And once again, I pulled up a map. <laughs> These are not adjacent countries. Like Yeah, not even close. No. no. He would have had to be in the air for like a week <laughs> on a hang glider <laughs> to get that far. But his whole thought was like if he crashed, he would just land in the Dead Sea and float because he doesn't know how to swim, which, again, goes back to the boat thing. <laughs> what? Yeah. So he <laughs> he crashes his hang glider and then uh, shows back up at Marcy's uh, broken and battered. Yeah. There, there's a portion in the middle of the movie where it almost feels like kind of the montage of Gary goes, tries a wacky plan It doesn't work. He comes back to Marcy and you see the strain on the relationship as it continues to happen because she likes him and she wants him around. But his mission for God always takes precedence for him. He goes back and forth. He has a couple like uh, little personal crises as he thinks about like quitting. and, And then God comes back and tells him that he's an idiot and God doesn't like quitters. So him actually getting into Pakistan finally, because he has to go and get special. Yeah, he has to get a special visa. Yeah, special visa. And the guy's just like, no, I'm not going to give you that. (laughs) And he goes off on his rant about, you know, 
about how he's going to Pakistan to capture Osama bin Laden and, it, and, and bring know, it back gonna, for justice and stuff. Say, yeah, and the guy just shrugs and stamps his stamps the paperwork and sends him on his way. Yeah, which is I feel is just assisted suicide at that point. <laughs> And then goes on his way. And then we have a weird 15 minutes of him just bumming around Pakistan. Yeah, you really see like how aimless his mission was and like how he had no plan. No. Because he's just in town in Pakistan asking people about the bearded one. Well, and like, also how aimless this movie is. This is really the slow part. This, this is the slow part. Yeah. But he's looking for Beanie Boy. I think it's the part that probably is the most accurate. Yeah. I mean, what? I think it's the part that has the least embellishment. Are we also, do we also assume that the scene where he totally sorted some guys to death in an alley is probably also real? I think it's likely. (laughs) I mean, that's a weird scene is all I'm saying. Yeah. I think it's funny that like, he's just like bumbling American Batman in Pakistan, just like has a sword and not getting his dialysis not getting his dialysis obviously having hallucinations my favorite of which is when he hallucinates mtv's cribs osama bin laden yeah the next sword fight that we've talked about previously happens in this movie yes so he bumbles around uh pakistan for a while a friend of his slash security guard for the hotel he's staying at gets gunned down in the street and he assumes it was Osama coming for him. So chases this guy into the hills, falls down from exhaustion or just not getting dialysis for like a month and is immediately hang gliding over Pakistan. Yeah. Sees Osama bin Laden down there is coming for him. Coming for you, Benny boy. <laughs> and then they then he wakes up in a cave on his dialysis machine across from Osama bin Laden, also on a dialysis machine. <laughs> because he did require dialysis. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Authenticity. This movie knew exactly when to end, and it's right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, no one's sticking around for any more of him, like, bumbling around. Let's just put him in a cave together. So, yes, they have their sword fight. Yeah, so... <laughs> One of two Nick Cage sword fights. Yeah. Osama bin Laden, Nick Cage, Katana sword fight... After getting dialysis in a cave. It's 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 a great moment. It is. For Americans. I also love when they both just like swing the katanas at each other and they hit each other's swords and they both just drop their swords like, ow, that hurts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As anybody who is not practiced in swinging a sword will do the first time. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know. I've never swung a sword. No, I imagine it's like rebar and I've swung rebar around. <laughs> It's just metal in your hands. It just hurts. Yeah. <laughs> you got soft hands. But it was a fun sword fight. It was a good one. It was a fun little, like, action scene. Which this movie had plenty of decent action. Yeah. Like I said, there's a lot in this movie that should have been better. Uh, we do get to see him masturbate. So that's uh, <laughs> More, both movies both Nicolas movies. Cage masturbates in. And plays fictional versions of real people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh After his fight with Osama, he wakes up in a hospital bed and is immediately uh, sent back to America. No charges filed. Yeah, well, so the CIA or whatever had been looking for him because they'd been hearing about an American samurai who is just terrorizing (laughs) this neighborhood and they couldn't find him. And eventually, so they find him, they send him back and Gary goes home and makes up with Marcy, swears his mission is over. He just wants to. Be a be a family man. Then, you know, all the news outlets show up on our house, on our doorstep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Then cut to again. Sorry. (laughs) Another another thing from this movie is the protagonist questioning who was going to play him in the script of the movie. (laughs) And he's like, Nicolas Cage can play me. Everybody tells me that Nicolas Cage and Con Air looks a lot like me. And it's like, oh, Jesus. I know we did end up with two of the most meta Nick Cage movies. Uh, I guess the new one is pretty meta too, but well, well, yeah. it's surprising that we ended up with these head to head just randomly. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, it was really convenient that we got two movies where he plays fictionalized characters of real people. Mm. But just to wrap up the movie, the Barack Obama speech of we got him 
Oh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, Marcy is clearly happy that this dumbassery can end. And Gary just loses his shit about how, why don't they show us the body? Yeah, he they never caught him. He's still out there. So full conspiracy theory. Planning his next sojourn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the movie, you get a little splash of text that tells you Gary is looking to use the move or the money he receives for this movie to buy a new kidney so he can continue his mission. Which, boy, I don't think there's a lot of money in this for, for Gary. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure his, like he got paid something. I don't know how much a kidney goes for, but I'm sure he got like half off of a kidney at least. But we do for get having to, his story optioned. Yeah, we get to see some of actual Gary, on, like he was on The View. Yeah, um, and he has a very normal speaking voice. Uh, it's not as affected as Nicolas Cage's for sure, but Nicolas Cage obviously gave us a great character. Yeah. It definitely rambled for a while and then suddenly ended. It had a, a little crisis of identity in the last third, for sure. But yeah, I don't. This movie doesn't. Is his character supposed to be funny because how absurd he is? Or are we supposed to like root for him? Is he actually a hero? Like it. Yeah. The the problem really is that just nothing really happens. There's mm-hmm. no resolution for what gary is trying to go through no and that's unfortunate yeah what do you do it's an ongoing story he's still out there fighting the good fight god bless him looking for the bearded one bearded one benny boy Mm -hmm. um do you have a favorite quote uh so this has three and i'm gonna give them to you in my favorite order and they're all obviously from the beginning of the movie (laughs) all right The first one is when Gary's on dialysis and I'll try not to do. No, I'm just going to Gary voice it. Man, this country makes the best goddamn chicken wings in the world. Now, I haven't seen the whole world. I haven't tasted chicken wings in Africa, but I'd be willing to bet the right ball on a broke dick dog that no place makes better wings than they do here. (laughs) That was my quote. Man. I love that. That's such a good quote. Uh, It starts off so strong. (laughs) Yeah. And he's just like fucking at church, basically, here in dialysis, just preaching to people about his weird ass shit. I love that one. It's not my favorite quote, though. I I like it, but it's not my best. The next two are both out of the Home Depot scene because he's just walking around. And like Sean said, he's just giving terrible. It's not even advice. He's just belittling everything at Home Depot. So he's walking past two guys that are just looking at two by fours. He's like, I don't know what you're putting up, but that ain't going to hold it. And just walks fast. And it's like, what? (laughs) And my favorite was just don't buy that toilet. That toilet was made in Africa. Pygmies made that toilet and they take small shits. Your turd, your potty, your poo, as it were, won't make it past the flusher. That's my favorite. The poo, as it were. And I'm sorry that I have the voice for this. It's really, (laughs) it took me back immediately. I know I tried to do a bit of a deep dive and find any information I could about this movie. And it is, it's absolutely. It's tough. There's like nothing out there. The the only thing that really made me laugh, I I love a good succinct statement. And in Wikipedia, uh, talking about reviews, it just said this received negative reviews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fucking bet. All right. Well, hit me, Sean. What do you got? <laughs> you, you took my favorite quote. Oh, do you want to try to read it in the voice and see who did it better? No, it's all right. I've got to I got to touch on one thing that I brought up earlier. Um, so I was looking at the music for this. Sean was asking some questions about it and I was looking at the music credits at the end. And I realized that there is one song listed as performed by Nick Cage. And now I have to go back and watch this whole fucking movie to try and find it. <laughs> Hmm. And I assume it's performed by Nick Cage as Gary. Well, if you find it, I really would appreciate it if it was our outro music this week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we get sued for that. Don't sue us, what Larry if it's Charles. Just us making the noises of it. Ooh. Like, do, 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 do. Is that and, the theme from Doug? Uh, we can't confirm or deny that. All right. So this gets us to the main main question then, right? 
Do you, do you want to explain what we're doing here again, just for the listeners and all the people who complain that we just jumped the gun last oh, week? Oh, yeah, the people who tune in at the well, I, hour I think, mark. So the main... Yeah, right, those <laughs> the people. sons of bitches, they're taking food out of my kids' mouths. So, I mean, the main thing is that it's it's a head-to-head matchup. It's bracket style. There's 64 Nick Cage movies. We're going to go through them all um, week by week. Uh, so these guys have to decide the winner. But the rules are made up and they don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the winner? I mean, it's adaptation. It has to be adaptation. It's Army of One. <laughs> My God. I honestly would rather watch Army of One. It's not a better film, though. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, well, episode two. And we've already... We Controversy. Yeah. In this head-to-head matchup, like, one of these has to win. I'm okay being an ultimate tiebreaker if we need it. But I think it's better if you guys debate and figure out a consensus. We, we should have discussed the rules for this beforehand. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> the rules are made up and they don't matter. Yeah. Fuck, you're right. Hoist on my own petard. I mean, we've always been clear about this eventually boils down into which movie do you want to watch more? Because you will watch. <sighs> yeah, we're yeah. going to have to watch it again. It's true. And, and again. And yeah, again. Potentially three, three to four times. times? Yeah. yeah. Three times total view like weeks of it three episodes of it yeah but i've watched all of these movies multiple times in preparation for it and i can say that like through my watching like yeah i mean structurally the the script the acting adaptation was a more complete movie but i didn't leave the movie thinking about parts of it that i liked i finished the movie And I was like, oh, okay, that was a good movie. And I did something else. Army of One gave me reasons, good and bad, to think about the movie. And I didn't stop thinking about it. You can't. Yeah. And I think ultimately that wins it for me because I I finished it, but it wasn't done with me. (laughs) Oh, That's hard to argue. And okay, I get it. I've definitely thought more about Army of One. But not for good reasons, <laughs> but mostly because it is so bad. There's just so much more fun to talk about it. But sometimes bad's fun. No, I agree. I love terrible things. Ice Jiu-jitsu. pirates. Uh, oh yeah, ice pirates. We need it. that. That'll be for the Patreon. We'll just watch ice pirates. It has nothing <laughs> for to do with no just reason. because. Yeah. Jujitsu. <sighs> I mean, I'd rather watch jujitsu. Really? Yeah. Mm. Love jujitsu. I have had two friends who have watched it because of our first episode, and they're still my friends. Yeah, somehow I don't think we're going to get any big converts to Army of One. I mean, that's ultimately what it is for me is I can't. Last week, I was adamant that people should watch Jiu-Jitsu. No one should watch Army of One. Uh, I disagree. That's fair. Up to that point. And even in the end, it's interesting. It's a uh, much more hopeful story. It's made me it made me aware of it. It made me interested in it. Normally, a story like this has to start with words like Florida man. And it's not. <laughs> He's from Colorado. He's just, I don't know, so unique. I like the character. I keep going back and I'm like, maybe it would have worked better for like, I mean, obviously he's a real person. I can't just say this would have been better in like a a sketch performance kind of SNL sort of situation, like recurring character. But he seems like the kind of guy that would just pop into your life. It's fucking weird for a little bit. And then he goes to Pakistan and to find bin Laden. Yeah. And I, I've had weird people like that in my life. I have too. And and most of them have fucked me over, which is why I don't think I like Gary. <laughs> that's fair. But uh, I don't think you have a sweet born free like tramp stamp with I, American flags. I don't. Um, my tramp stamp says something very different. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it ultimately comes down to. I mean, i not a huge fan of the performance. Well, there's a lot to be said about his performance because as we said last week, Cage never stops. He's never doesn't give a half ass performance and he gives it his all. And I just think it was the wrong creative decision. (laughs) I don't know. It's like you get this blue collar American hero for the audience and you just see him put into situations where like, yeah, he doesn't succeed every time. But when he does, it's what counts. And it's in like building relationships you having know, a family. I will I will renege on something here. This is ultimately a movie or ultimately a podcast about Nick Cage films. Adaptation is an Oscar nominated performance. Army of One is full cage. In terms of a film that is 
100% a Nicolas Cage film. It's Army of One, I guess. Oh, that's... That hurts my soul. I have to watch this again now. I want it on the record, though. Eh, Adaptation's a better film. Yeah, structurally, like critically. Sure. Yeah, I mean... I'm sure Nick Cage made $5 million, though. (laughs) That seems to be the pattern. Uh, Peter, do you have thoughts on uh, which film should win? You know what? Honestly, guys, like, I don't... (laughs) I don't think it fucking matters. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that Nick kind of hit on the main point. Like if if this is about like the movie, the Nick Cage movie that you can just watch a million times, then and, and that's the thesis for our show, then that's the winner. Right. Like, what's the thing that you can continue to go back to? And like and we're talking about the best Nick Cage movie. It doesn't have to be critically the best movie. This is true. Right. Like Ghost Rider so. could be the winner. Right. Even though that's not no, truly a great no, Ghost Rider Spirit to Vengeance. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Could be the best movie. Um, so yeah, uh, all right, that's our second film. Definitively, um, and if you have other opinions, uh, I don't care. Suck yeah, it. we're not on Twitter or anything, so yeah. just write about it into the void. Again, this yeah. is... A- just <laughs> shout it at your neighbor, but be sure to tell him <laughs> yes. that it's for Cage Match, so he has to listen. Yeah, Cage Match, cage match with Nick and Sean, yeah. specifically. Oh, guerrilla marketing. Yeah, that's right. Yell your complaints about our opinions at your neighbors and tell them where to go <laughs> to hear said opinions so they can yell them at their neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited about next week's... We keep saying week, but, uh, yeah. you know, things happen. People get COVID, Nick. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about hey, next Hey, I'm just a episode. really good kisser. I can't help it. It's true. It's weird. Um, I didn't get it, though. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So next up is Pig. Ooh. Critically acclaimed, uh, which you guys have so not seen. And fail. I have. I have not seen. And it's going <laughs> to fail because it's going up against his absolute worst rated film left behind, which is like definitely some sort of Christian allegory. Ridiculous Ooh. shit. So have fun, guys. Yeah. We. What, what does Hayden have? Pizza pockets? I mean, he strikes me as an Uncrustables guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. That's, that's the meanest thing you've ever said. <laughs>